uh, across the world, wherever you happen to find yourself. My goodness, uh, just to let you know, it's currently standing on 346 uh, people that are listening in. Uh, what a wonderful, warm uh, group of people. So thank you to each and every one of you for finding time to be with us. Uh, you know, the nature of these webinars is that uh, some of the participants usually have a last minute struggle to link up. So let's just give them a few seconds uh, to uh, bridge the technology. Uh, we'll start very soon. Uh, Murphy's Law, cell phone. Uh, Chris, do you want to show that slide? The uh, the uh, holding slide with the various websites and so on. Yeah, excellent. So uh, just while we wait for, you know, late stragglers to join, there are some websites here that you may want to take note of. But the one I'd like to particularly ask you uh, uh, maybe try and use as the Appman site, which is a very useful site for uh, people with um, malaria interest and uh, including especially the, the vector uh, control community. So there are a number of different uh, places there that, that I'm sure you would find very interesting. Okay, so uh, again, great big hello and welcome to everyone, wherever you may be across the planet. As I said, there are apparently 346 people listening in right now, we're very grateful. Um, so the webinar uh, is on the role and status of bed nets, indoor residual spraying and insecticide resistance in Asia Pacific. Uh, so I just need to introduce myself. My name is Leo, Leo Brock, and I'm the technical lead for the Appman Vector Control Working Group. Uh, and I have a great pleasure, I'd like to acknowledge them of working with a, a wonderful team of people, including uh, Dr. Tin Cho Thu and also Chris Mercado and Dr. Fonsi, Fonsi Hine, and of course, uh, Appman Senior Director Amita Chebi, who unfortunately is in and out of meetings and may not be able to sit with us full time. Uh, but they're in the background uh, there, making sure that the technology is all linked up and working. And um, Appman, as you may or may not know, stands for the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network. And it works very closely with APALMA, which is the Asia Pacific Malaria Leaders Alliance. And APALMA is the political and policy lead and APMAN more of the, the implementing partner. So APMAN does much of its uh, implementation of its activities through the various working groups of which APMAN VCWG, Vector Control Working Group is one. And uh, this webinar is a product uh, of that vector control working group. And it serves as a platform to facilitate capacity, capacity building initiatives, such as our annual two week training courses in aspects of vector surveillance, but also information sharing via conferences, web platforms and webinars uh, such, such as we're having right now. This is our fourth webinar since June. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that they've received good audience numbers and feedback on quality. So it seems that there is a genuine need or interest for sharing experience and lessons learned uh, among the vector control practitioners in Asia Pacific. But it seems also further abroad. Uh, our audience comprises people listening in from North America, South America, Africa, Europe, all over the place. Uh, and we're very grateful to you for finding time to participate in these webinar, uh, webinars. So sincere thank you for your time and inconvenience. Some of you are getting up very early in the morning uh, in, in the US and so on. A bit of background to this particular webinar. Since the inception of uh, malaria control more than a century ago, vector control has been the primary strategy for combating malaria. And in recent decades, the focus has been on the use of insecticide treated nets, ITNs, and indoor residual spraying of insecticides. In Asia Pacific, much of the transmission occurs outdoors uh, and such outdoor transmission is a major driver of uh, residual malaria, of course. 
Um, but although because much of this biting occurs outdoors, it does not mean we may as well stop the use of LLINs and IRS. Reducing the use of ITNs and IRS risks a resurgence of malaria due to a resumption of high levels of indoor biting. So ITNs and IRS has to continue. So what is the current level of use of IRS as a control you, as a control tool and of bed nets? And how are we doing in monitoring continued susceptibility of mosquitoes to these insecticides? We had originally lined up four presenters to do justice to this very broad topic, but one pulled out very early uh, and another one also for work reasons two days ago, but we were very fortunate to get at very short notice uh, a replacement speaker. So we are back up to three presenters and they are excellent uh, top quality people, I can uh, uh, assure you. So I, I just need to spend a, a few seconds on how this webinar will unfold and I'll try to be brief, I promise you. We will have three PowerPoint presentations back to back varying between five and 10 minutes each uh, and that'll be followed by a question and answer, answer session. Everyone is going to be muted and video off except for our, our panelists. Uh, our audience members, uh, you can submit written questions during the presentations. And I ask members of the audience to please look at those questions periodically. And if there are questions that you like or support, uh, then you can upvote that question. You just click on the, the little thumbs up icon below the question. And depending on how many people do that, uh, click on the thumbs up, the question moves up the hierarchy, up the list. And this is important because we won't have time to deal with all the questions. And I'm probably only going to ask the panelists to respond to the top few questions because of the volume and, and lack of time. So your vote de decides which questions go to the top of the pile. And then at the end of the webinar, we will put up a, a short poll, in fact, two short polls. Uh, it's a very few short questions uh, where you just click on a particular choice of response. Uh, and that we, and we ask that you please take the one minute uh, to answer those poll questions, please. The one component is about your level of satisfaction. I perceived this webinar and the value uh, you got out of it. And that helps us to improve our presentations. And then there's another short one uh, about what you think the next webinar and subsequent webinars should be. So, you know, it kind of guides us uh, to what the next webinar topic should be. Please uh, note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the Appman website in a few days time. That's the website that I was referring to earlier on. Okay. So let's get to the uh, presentations. Chris, uh, would you mind placing our esteemed speakers on screen, please? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, maybe our presenters can put their videos on so that we can see them in real life, as it were, uh, just for our audience to meet you, see who you are. Um, we have the pleasure of having with us today three top rate, uh, really good uh, vector experts. And first up is going to be uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, Srivastava, followed by uh, Dr. Tessa Knox. And then we end off with a bang with, uh, prof uh, with uh, Prof. Uh, Tirapap, Charyan Viryapap. Uh, to these speakers, please accept uh, the gratitude from all of us. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone in the audience as well for finding time to put together your presentations and be with us today. We appreciate uh, your, your time. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, uh, Pradeep, would you like to put your, your first slide on screen and I'll ask uh, our other presenters for the moment just to maybe turn your videos off again. Uh, so it's just uh, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, Dr. Srivastava, or Dr. Pradeep Kumar Srivastava is going to talk on uh, issues around ITNs and IRS and testing for insecticide resistance in, in India. 
Dr. Shivastava is former head of the Division of Entomology and Vector Control in the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program uh, in India. Uh, now in his retirement years, he is director of the Absolute Human Care Foundation in India. He's also co-chair of the APMAN VCWG. Uh, and Dr. Srivastava obtained his doctorate in 1984 on insecticide residue analysis from the University of Al Al Allahabad. He was elected as a life member of the Indian Society of Malaria and other communicable diseases, elected as a fellow of the Royal Entomological Society of London in 1993. Uh, he was the Indian nodal officer for elimination of lymphatic filariasis during period 2004 to 2016. Uh, he's been advisor to WHO on many occasions for elimination of lymphatic filariasis, and he's been the recipient of a Festigard Franson Award in 2019 by the National Academy, Academy of Vector-Borne Diseases in India. So, uh, Dr. Pradeep, would you mind sharing with us some of your, your wisdom and experience, uh, please? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Leo, and a formal good morning from India to everyone who are listening. And thank you very much, and my appreciation that you have, you have said two words uh, uh, I may deserve, may not deserve that much, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, may I start my presentation? Uh, please do, Pradeep. Okay, okay. So before we start on the theme of the today's webinar, let me give a glimpse of what is happening in India, what is the current scenario that uh, if you look on this, the malaria situation has significantly declined. 71% decline does not even show in country. Similarly, we are dealing, I mean, the program has been dealing, national program has been dealing with six vector bond diseases. The Lishmaniasis, the upper three one, they are targeted for elimination. The visceral Lishmaniasis, Kala Azar, it was prevalent by and large in four states and uh, the number of districts were also very less. And the Elimination target was less than one case per 10,000 population. So the endemic blocks have been reduced drastically from 633 to very, very minimum level. Very, very minimum level. It's in two figures only. Regarding lymphatic filariasis, as you are seeing in malaria, the same way you are seeing in lymphatic filariasis, the at risk population when the whole thing was started, complete country you are looking red patches and now slowly slowly at the end of after 10 12 years it is gone down and further it is gone down because this data is up to 2017 or 18 and maybe we can show that the further red spots are reduced dengue yes this is a concern dengue and chikungunya arboviral diseases this is actually spreading and this is uh, we can say that this is basically attributed to the, our behavior also. We are also equally responsible in addition to some technical issues. But it is not only India, it is fast spreading to many parts of the world. So, but mortality has been contained and mortality has been reduced. Same is the case for Japanese encephalitis. This also, it has gone down and CFR has reduced drastically. If you see the CSR has been reduced from to 10% from initially after about five years, six years before it was 17%. So the, 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 the background which I just wanted to give was that in India, by and large, there is a reduction except few uh, arboviral diseases. Going to the next slide. The basic strategy for if sorry uh, basic strategy for the malaria elimination as for the concept of this today's talk was we have stratified and in the stratified area the focused approach has been taken i will i will restrict my talk only on vector management which is under the umbrella of integrated vector management and you look here the highest endemic area is the red color the middle order is the, the, the pink color 
and then the clear area is the green color the low end so if we start from the high risk area that is high burden states high burden districts we have classified into category 3 which is actually 10 states are falling in this category all the integral component of integrated vector management are to be implemented here whereas some will be dropped in the middle uh, cases the uh, <clears throat> little lesser uh, endemic criteria and we have fixed the criteria also that the criteria <clears throat> three is that all the districts and the total api of the state that is malaria cases per thousand population is above one whereas in category 2 the the number of districts some may show uh, high endemicity and overall even the the state average api is less than one but the sum of the districts are shown above one here in case of green the low endemic area the total uh, api of the average as well as all the districts are shown less than one so there are there are some climatic effect also where the malaria transmission cannot happen There, but there are certain places where the endemicity was already right from beginning it was low and then some some places it has been brought down uh, reduced to the level so there the the, the operational uh, challenges will be less but the sustenance challenges the maintenance challenges will be very very high because they have to continue for a longer time to sustain and stop the impact till 2030 at least as very very clearly visible in this chart which is a complex management of integral integral parts of vector management we have to we have to see the governance we have to see the monitoring we have to see the surveillance from center to state state monitoring then we have to see capacity building at different level district corporation ngo pri community based organization till the community leaders block primary health center sub centers and the we have got one very important uh, uh, human resource uh, the lowest uh, in, in, uh, identity in the health system is the asha asha is an abbreviation of accredited social health activity this is performance based uh, community volunteers they are not salaried employee but they are based on um, their performance is incentivized and then we have to monitor the impact and impact not only by direct one which has impact will be affected by activities of all these parasite control vector control performance of the the, the, the different stakeholders performance of the governing bodies at the, the the public health sector and then the role of media on the different stakeholders so all these complications leads to the challenges which has resulted in this but we are mainly see that these implementations are done now if we go to the next slide this is very important slide to take up vector management we have to deal with insecticide efficacy we have to select the appropriate and effective insecticide so there are two components under integrated vector management on which the program relies most in addition to all other very important integral components of integrated vector management we will not discuss here on source selection and environmental engineering and manipulation but in indoor residual spray direct attack on the reduction of and longevity of the vector mosquitoes and adding adding that in addition to that cutting the longevity and reducing and the vector in addition that personal protection so we will discuss about the long lasting insecticide so these two components irs and lli are very very crucial to give the immediate tent so for insecticide resistance status monitoring indian program has been very alert since beginning and i just give one example if you look on this map this is map of anopheles turisfaces the major rural vector in indian scenario from 85 to 90 data was published on insecticide resistance and the basic thing is that whichever is the bar things it's a resistance against ddt malathion and that time it used to be hchs which is banned now from april 97 so the purpose is done then there there was a mapping was done by 
2013 and 2014 it is a separate map we have done because there was a specific purpose for that now see look here dt resistance then again 2015 and to map such kind of generate such kind of data and a population it was 120 crores uh, 1200 crores sorry this is the, cannot be done by one individual so there are 13 14 units are involved in addition to our program component 84 in fact in 1977 first time the entomological zones were established and that zones were covering three or four districts and this was one major important job to do the monitor the insecticide resistance and after that icmr institutions national center for disease control and now recently very recently different universities have lined up with the program and they are all supporting they are all generating data some are doing their own research projects some are they they are they are sponsored research projects but the outcome is always supporting the programs making this map even the recent one if you see the recent one you see if you try to uh, corroborate with this uh, high burden district high burden area for malaria transmission in country and then the resistance of ddt with red color you see so still there are some area which is susceptible to ddt and that is why the spraying with ddt is also being done though it is been reduced significantly the quantity of ddt which is being mandated by very very high level committee in as a follow up of the stockholm convention ddt quantity has been reduced significantly and same is the case with the uh, on the contrary same is the case with the especially on the llin which is the another very very important component we have increased the llin usage and distribution why because the one way you are major component ddt you are reducing or other insecticides is being procured by the states so llin is being supplied by directly by government of india and if you look from little little earlier 2009 10 we have started llin business to to rush into program 83 million has been supplied 83 or 84 million absolutely it has been supplied so far and if you analyze the insecticide the total population covered in india for spray operations as per category 3 area or some of the category 2 so called spray roughly around 45 50 i remember it used to be 60 million population it has been reduced because malaria incidence is also reduced and the criteria has has gone down so ddt 20 to 25 million approximately the population is covered whereas in malathion around 8 to 10 million population. and synthetic pyrethroid in 10 to 10 to 12 million roughly it is being covered in that now if you look on this if you do the back calculation for analysis purposes if ddt uh, covers 25 million you require this much quantity of insecticide whereas malathion requirement you require around this much malathion quantity the, the, the population projected is sometimes it is half of that 70% or 80% is only covered synthetic pyrethroid you it is increased little bit during middle of the 4 5 years before now roughly around 10 to 12 million population is being covered and we 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 require 60 metric ton per million population if we uh, calculate compute in terms of 2.5% roughly around 600 metric ton uh, synthetic pyrethroid but llin has been this you see this LLIN, if you want one net per 1.8 persons, and we have given around 40 million in last uh, last year, so it will be 22.5 million people will be affected. So this is this is this is the the, the gaps will always be a little bit challenged. The important point of this uh, total total uh, analysis is that. issue comes in the field that why llin is being preferred over irs once we have analyzed the irs situation compliance has never improved actual coverage spray coverage has never gone uh, above 60% though on the if you calculate on the room size or population wise it may cross 80% or 90% but actually and all the assessment reports it, it doesn't go beyond 60% just 
So why it is there and why people are refusing? Basically, if you co compare with LLIN and IR, there are four or five points I have just tried to. There are many more if you talk to the people. Individual benefits are perceived on uh, if they get LLI. Similarly, they feel that once it has been supplied to them, this becomes their property. So this is their, their, their basically their, their, their property and they are using it. Then they feel that government is also contributing. So there is a cooperation from the government supplies, which is not actually in case of. It used to be in, in, uh, in 50s and 60s when malaria workers used to go for a spread. Then out of pocket expenditure, some places where the people are buying themselves to get mosquito nuisance, they are saving that out of pocket expenditure on purchase of it. And so it is very less, 300, 400. But for poor people, for, for, for poor people yes, it is, it, is, it is a huge amount. Now, three years on an average, they get relief with using one bed net. That, that, that is very important for them, that, that they understand. And then they are, it is very easy to carry. See, this lady, old lady, she's just carrying two bed nets she has got. Then there are special situations, there are special privilege. And those privilege are that silk industry. I know I have worked in, 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 in Karnataka. They are silk culture and absolutely insecticide IRS was refused. So the biological control came into picture. But now silk industry, they can, they can, because this is kept in the inside the house and it is used only for the, then zoom cultivation. Look here, there is one photograph I have tried to get it. It is not exactly zoom cultivation, but zoom cultivations are also like similar like this. So the people, they can just carry and then they can tie a forest fringe area, resettlement colony, labor aggregation, construction site. It is very, very easy to get it. But the issue is that criteria, the norms has to be revised for the making the supply or allowing the people to use such kind of protective measures for them. This is very, very important. And then on the basis of that, my suggestions are the suggestion for better approach will be that local situation there should be evidence based decision which is a one one very important point under ivm also but i have just given one example for lin that locally if it is required it should be acceptability and usability both has to be seen many areas you just cannot use llin or a, even bed net or a very humid area people they get suffocated so they they, they cannot People's behavior and suitable amendments in the strategy plan is required. And because that is why I have always been telling that guidelines are never final lines. It is open subject to for amendments on, on the situation basis. So situation analysis is very, very important. And then the most important point that its entomological impact on mosquito bite, mosquito nuisance, prevention, disease prevention, vector mosquitoes, reducing lunch. I mean, very simple terms. SOP like uh, one one page uh, pamphlet, it can be given and then entomological factors can be convinced only by the entomologist and community satisfaction. So as long as entomologists are there, the entomological factors can be explained to the community and that has given a dividend in the, in the past also. So for today, I think uh, my message is that uh, entomological factors need to be convinced and need to be added along with all other benefits in the program. I will stop here. My acknowledgments, great acknowledgments to Dr. Kalpana Barua, who is actually in driving seat in the National Vector Bound Disease Control Program. And I have always been showing this chapter that program, government run program, state government run program, research institutions, academic institutions. NGOs, the stakeholders, and the most important community. Unless all of them, they join and understand the problem, we have, we cannot do. So we have to join together with epidemiologists, entomologists, parasitologists, microbiologists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, may I ask if you can stop sharing your screen? Uh, to enable the next speaker to be able to uh, share screen. But uh, thank you so much for that peek through the window as to what is going on in India. Uh, you know, you, you only have so many uh, minutes allocated to you. You can only share so much uh, in those few minutes. 
but you did it very well, I think, you know, just to convey to us, give us a sense of uh, what the current status is in India. And, you know, the relative use of IRS and LLINs, it's all very interesting to create uh, an impression of uh, what is going on in India in terms of uh, um, vector control. So I always find it fascinating that, um, you know, in, in some countries, in Southern Africa, for example, the emphasis is exclusively on indoor residual spraying, zero bed nets. And then in other countries, the, the focus is entirely on LLINs, zero ITNs. Uh, and then, you know, there are recent studies in Africa that show, uh, you know, when, but maybe I must not talk too much about that, but, um, when bed nets have reached the, the plateau of efficacy in vector control, supplementing it with IRS gives immediate increase in uh, uh, vector control impact and decline in, uh, in malaria case numbers. So, you know, the, the, the ideal is probably application of both if possible but there are many other factors involved, as you explained, cultural acceptance of, of nets and IRS financial uh, factors. So very complicated uh, and it depends on, on finance, depends on cultural uh, issues, but uh, thank you so much. Dr. Pradeep, I'm going to give you a free plug because I'm so impressed by what you and your co-director of the Absolute Human Care Foundation are achieving by way of those uh, entomological intelligence webinars that you are putting on at weekly intervals. Uh, I've had the good fortune uh, of stumbling on it uh, and listening in on three so far, and I'm hugely impressed and I think this being pro predominantly a vector community uh, platform or audience, I'm convinced that fellow uh, vector uh, entomologists will be equally interested in hearing about uh, the very high level uh, vector uh, talks that are being presented usually on a Saturday or a Sunday night uh, on the, or uh, presented by the Absolute Human Care Foundation. So I'd like to suggest to the audience, do yourselves a favor, genuine, uh, go to Google, plug in Absolute Human Care Foundation, and you'll see there, I think it's on the very first page, you can register for the next uh, webinar. Absolutely worth it, there's a wealth of experience entomological experience, vector control, malaria general epidemiological experience. Uh, so uh, I, I can definitely recommend it. So uh, Dr. Pradeep, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us those insights. I'm going to move on uh, to Dr. Tessa Knox. Uh, Tessa, would you mind getting your first slide on screen? So Dr. Tessa Knox is going to talk to us on the reintroduction of IRS into the Pacific Islands, some background and uh, current status. Uh, and Dr. Knox is the WHO advisor to the Vanuatu Ministry of Health on malaria and other vector-borne diseases. She holds a PhD in uh, uh, tropical public health from the University of Queensland. Her work with WHO and earlier with academia and private sector has focused on vector surveillance and control, mainly uh, she says mainly in Asia, Africa, the Americas and the Pacific. She may as well have said the entire globe <laughs> because that's pretty much. So we, we consider it a, a privilege to have you participating, Dr. Tessa, and look forward uh, to, to the issues you are going to share with us uh, and your expertise. Thank you for, for your presentation. Over to you, uh, uh, Tessa. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Leo, and good evening to everyone. It's now 5.30 where I am, which is uh, 
a small Pacific Island country, um, an archipelago, archipelago of 83 islands. It's somewhere between Australia and Fiji. Um, I'm uh, here, the Malaria Advisor to the Ministry of Health, Vanuatu, but I also am the focal point for the Pacific on vector control. So today I wanted to talk to you about the situation in three countries, three malaria endemic countries of the region. So that's Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu. Um, you can see in the slide here that there's a, a small child lying under an LLIN. This is really the current norm for these three Pacific Island countries. But what I wanted to talk to you about was some exciting work that's being done to reintroduce indoor residual spraying into these three countries after some years with with no IRS being used. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to start with a bit of background of the malaria situation in these three countries. Firstly, to the Solomon Islands, you can see from the orange bars here that this is the number of confirmed cases um, since uh, per 1,000 population since the 1960s. Um, IRS is really the single vector control strategy that was used throughout the 1970s. It led to significant reductions um, in incidence. However, its use ended in 1989. This was really followed once withdrawal occurred with immediate increases in incidence up until about 1992 when um, IRS was introduced in a targeted manner as part of resumed intensified malaria interventions. As I said, it was used in a targeted way and this really did help with other tools, especially LLIs, to reduce the incidence. We did see a decline up until around 2015. Unfortunately, due to financial constraints in 2015, IRS use was again discontinued. And we have seen since then that there has been an increase in incidence. 2016, 2017, 18, and also likely to be in 2019 as well. This shows the incidence and number of deaths in Papua New Guinea since only 2000. Um, in fact, IRS usage in Papua New Guinea ceased um, in 1980s. Before then, it was used in a very uh, extensive way, very widespread usage. But in the 80s, as cost rose and effectiveness declined, um, this tool was largely abandoned as there was a turn towards using long-lasting insects, well, first of all, ITNs and then long-lasting insecticidal nets once they became available. So these became the primary measure. Although IRS was used in some focal responses, um, it, its use was very, very minimal. You can also see here in 2016 um, that there was some evidence of an increase in malaria incidence. This seems to have continued 2017, 18 and 19. We're yet to see what the situation may be for 2020. Um, hopefully there won't be much of an increase, but I think there have been queries over the um, efficacy of some of the bed nets that have been distributed over the past four to five years. And so we'll see uh, what 2020 holds. This slide shows the uh, data for Vanuatu. So the thick blue line is the API and the number of deaths is the yellow, the yellow dots. So in fact, since 2011, there have been no deaths attributable to, um, to malaria in Vanuatu. We saw a, a very steep decline up until, um, up until about 2008, 2009, when we saw an increase. This can largely be attributed to a strengthening of the surveillance system where we were just picking up a lot more cases as rapid diagnostic tests were introduced. Um, focal IRS really, sorry, in the 1970s, again, there was a focus on using IRS as the primary vector control measure. This was also replaced with ITNs and LLINs when they're available. Um, in the 1990s, there was a, sorry, 1980s, there was a study shown that showed or found no evidence of impact of IRS and transmission. So it was largely abandoned as an intervention. There was some use of focal IRS until around 2015 when its use completely ceased in Vanuatu. Unfortunately, this coincided with tropical cyclone PAM, which was a massive cyclone that affected a huge proportion of the population of Vanuatu. And we did see increases in incidence from 2016 um, and then declining again, 2017, 18 and 19. In 2019, we had 573 cases. Uh, so we are confident that malaria elimination is well within reach. But unfortunately, in April this year, 
Again, we had a category five massive cyclone that decimated the country, caused interruption to malaria services. Um, and although there was an emergency response to distribute bed nets, there are concerns about reporting rates at the moment. There are concerns about availability of RDTs and ACTs in some of the facilities. So we are concerned that there may have been a plateauing of progress um, and at worst that there may have been an increase in 2020 in malaria cases, but we will see what happens um, with the data as we collect it and we clean it and we analyze it. One point to make is that despite these challenges that we've had along the way, we have been able to maintain zero cases of malaria in Tafia province, which is the southernmost province. There's a case study you can see down the bottom right hand side of the slide that was supported by uh, APMAN, the drafting of it and the formulation by APMAN, and it provides a very nice summary of what the situation and what the challenges are in small Pacific Island nations like Vanuatu. So just, I thought it would be just worthwhile to reflect on some of the similarities across these three countries. So we do have ongoing persistent malaria transmission in some areas of these countries, not everywhere. Uh, this is largely driven by the Anopheles punctulatus group. So Anopheles ferrati, for example, is the only uh, vector in Vanuatu. Um, we have high rural populations and severe logistical challenges. There are many, many islands um, of Solomons and Vanuatu and there's large inaccessible highland areas of Papua New Guinea, which makes it very hard to deliver nets, to deliver IRS as well. All three countries, of course, have high vulnerability to natural disasters and outbreaks. This means, of course, high vulnerability to interruption of malaria services. If we do have um, earthquakes, we've had volcanic eruptions in Vanuatu, which event we haven't been able to distribute bed nets. Large populations that have been moving to different islands as they're evacuated from that volcanic activity as well. So a lot of issues with trying to just maintain the basics, malaria services, service delivery. Uh, there are issues with LLI and access usage um, and efficacy across the three countries. So particularly the case with Papua New Guinea, as I mentioned, there's been queries around the, the efficacy of the LLINs that have been distributed over the past few years. Um, ongoing issues with usage, particularly in elimination settings where uh, people feel like there's not so much of a need to continue using their nets. So it's really clear, I think, that additional vector control measures are required to accelerate progress in areas with ongoing transmission, but also to forge to malaria elimination in areas where we have still FOSO that remain. I think we can confidently say that, that IRS has been used successfully in these three countries in the past. There is no categorical or empirical evidence for this. There's no large cluster randomized control trials, but there is historical evidence. We have entomological evidence, we have circumstantial, and we have anecdotal evidence. And if you ask anyone who's worked with an IRS program in the Pacific, they're confident that what they were doing was having an impact and they observed that impact. My experience also of being in the field here is that the community love IRS um, we get, uh, when I was doing the malaria program review in Solomon Islands, we had a lot of people coming up and saying, why do we only have nets? Why don't we have IRS? We prefer IRS. It's what we used in the past and it worked. Um, so there's a large community demand as well for IRS in the region. The other similarity across the three Pacific countries is that all have recently undertaken malaria program reviews. So Vanuatu and Solomon's in 2018, PNG in 2019 and all have recently formulated malaria strategic plans that will commence in 2021. And this has really presented a good opportunity to be able to emphasize the importance of IRS and to try to create a clear case in funding requests to Global Fund and also in engagement with other, do other donors, that this really does need to be reinitiated. It's, the, it's one of the primary uh, tools that we think will be very helpful to forge forward to elimination in these three countries. So just a, a quick overview of how vector control is reflected in these three new strategies. Of course, all three of them have a very large emphasis on continuing with LLINs. There's no, no disputing this. LLINs are absolutely essential. They are the core tool that's being used. Um, all three strategies have mass and continuous distributions that are integrated in there and are costed and will be supported by the Global Fund. Um, all then have IRS added as a almost a, uh, a secondary measure. So this is not for blanket intervention in all areas. In Solomon's, it's for outbreak areas. In Papua New Guinea, it's for high burden areas or those areas where there's proof of low LLIN use. And in Vanuatu, this is really going to be targeted to, to foci, especially in the two provinces with remaining burden. 
um, and also responsive areas for outbreaks, such as following a, a large tropical cyclone or if there's been displaced persons that are all in a, in a um, IDP camp, then we'll be able to target the intervention to there. Also, it's important to note that in all of these strategies, there's an emphasis on a requirement for using a non-pyrethroid IRS um, formulation because of, in recognition of the fact that we don't want to be having pyrethroid LLINs as well as pyrethroid IRS. So just a very quick review of the progress in the plans for reinitiating IRS in these three countries. Um, we're very grateful that additional resources have been made available or will be made available through the Global Fund, through the regular allocation, and also through a malaria elimination in Melanesia and Timor-Leste initiative, so that's MEMTI. Um, Rotarians Against Malaria have been a partner in the past in countries like Vanuatu, and we've now reinitiated the dialogue with them and are very happy to now pursue support, their support for IRS as well. Um, we have historical surveillance data. So we've started in these three countries to look at identifying the areas where we think that, where we think would be the most impactful to implement IRS. We have detailed geographical reconnaissance mapping that will happen in those targeted areas. For example, in Vanuatu, this will start in November of this year so that we have a clear idea to guide our operations. We've identified master trainers for IRS and training of trainers will commence in 2021. We've started with procurement of equipment and supplies. And again, this is a focus on non-pyrethroid IRS. Um, consultant recruitment to support this work is also ongoing. And we have a number of candidates who've, who've stepped forward based on their, their experience working in the Pacific and with IRS. So we're very grateful to be able to have their assistance. Operational manuals, reporting forms, et cetera. All of this is planned. Um, and we have a huge amount of work that needs to be done uh, ahead of the implementation of IRS which we anticipate in 2021 in all three countries. And of course, and very, very importantly, we, we are going to make sure that this is all accompanied by robust monitoring and evaluation. So in PNG, for example, there'll be a very, very um, clear uh, assessment of acceptability to inform any scale up in IRS. This is not gonna happen everywhere straight away at once, but we'll do this gradually. Um, insecticide resistance monitoring is also planned. So I'm almost finished, I'm probably a bit over time, um, just to say that another critical factor, of course, is to have commitment. Uh, high level commitment has been clearly articulated by the three prime ministers or the then prime ministers at a summit in April in 2018, who committed to the goal of the end goal of malaria elimination. And there have been moves already so far. Vanuatu has in their new strategy is shifting the elimination target two years earlier. Solomons has launched a malaria elimination roadmap and PNG will follow suit when they develop their malaria elimination roadmap also. So uh, in summary, I just wanted to thank you for your attention. This is a picture from a, an area in northern Afate, the island that I'm on now. It's about an hour's drive from here. Just so I give you a bit of a taste of the Pacific. We are one of the few countries in the world that's COVID free. Uh, the government made a, an excellent decision to close the borders fully on the 23rd of March. So while you can't visit right now, we do hope we'll be able to have people visiting in the future so you can see um, the challenges that are here, but also the huge opportunities that we have with malaria elimination in Vanuatu and also in Solomons and PNG. Thank you very much. Tessa, thank you so much for that uh, very well articulated uh, presentation. Um, wonderful to hear about the political commitment uh, and that you've got global fund uh, funding available. Political commitment is one thing, but you need the resources to back it up. So very reassuring to hear that, and also to see the declines in, in malaria uh, incidents, et cetera. So thank you for that. I'm not going to waffle too much, uh, let's, because we're starting to run out of time. I'd rather leave, leave more time for question time. So may I, ask you to so if you'd mind uh, turning your video off and then for uh, Professor Tirapap you can turn your video on, unmute yourself and maybe pull up your presentation while I introduce you. Our next speaker uh, is the well-known uh, Professor Tirapap Charyan Viryapap uh, who is going to talk on the status of insecticide resistance and monitoring needs in Asia Pacific. <laughs> 
So Prof. Tira Pup is head of the Department of Entomology in the Faculty of Agriculture, Kasatsart University in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, his work is focused on blood-sucking insects effect affecting humans and livestock. And his current research topics include binomics of vectors of human and livestock diseases, vector incrimination and vector competence studies, vector behavior in response to insecticides used in control interventions and in response to the use of uh, repellents, and also on biochemical mechanisms of insecticide resistance and some studies on vector population genetics. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, Prof. Terapap has published extensively and also uh, patented some tools for use in studying mosquito behavior involving different insecticides used in disease control programs. So, Professor Terapap, it's a privilege to have you share your uh, extensive uh, knowledge and experience with us. We look forward to your presentation, a very broad uh, subject over a very broad geographic area on a very important uh, theme. So thank you for your time. Over to you, Professor Terapa. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Leo, uh, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon from Thailand to all friends and colleagues who are attending this webinar. Today I will speak about the insecticide resistance status and monitoring needs in Asia Pacific. Before beginning the talks, I would like to thank the Admin Gate Foundation, Thailand Research Fund for all kind supports. Special thanks go to my institution, Kaseya University, for for generous support and Thai Ministry of Armed Forces for supporting the field mosquito research station where most work has been gen generated. As you may know that Asia Pacific is home to more than 60% of world populations with approximately 4.3 billion people living in the area, including the, most, the world most crowded country like China and India. The WSO estimate over 400 million people in Asia Pacific were at risk of vector-borne disease infection and about 3.5 million contract malaria. Several vector-borne diseases are common in Asia-Pacific countries, such as malaria, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, and Japanese encephalitis. At present, no fully effective drug or vaccine are available for some vector-borne diseases. Vector-borne vector control remain one of the most available methods for reducing the transmission. Several vector control tools are to, to target mosquitoes include fabric impregnated with pyrethroid for special repellents, DEET or botanical for topical repellents, insecticidal space spray using fogging or ULV, larval habitat salt reduction, push-pull system using combination of special repellent and extractant trap, sterile insect technique, and extractive toxic sugar-based system used, uh, used a strategy of attract and kill. Several techniques are linked to chemical insecticide, for example, fabric impregnated with pyrethroid or, or insecticide space spray raised some concerns about insecticide and resistant issue. Four main groups of insecticide include organophosphate, organochlorine, carbamate, and pyrethroids. Some of them were banned or removing from public health use, for example, DDT in some countries. Besides new generation of insecticide in the neonicotinoids group are now claimed to be potential compound in combating against mosquito and other insect pests. Massive and continuous use of insecticides may cause insecticide resistance in insect population. Insecticide resistance can be classified into two major groups, which are physiological resistance and behavioral avoidance. 
physiological resistance occur when an insect modifies the target site of the insecticide and produce more resistant genes in the population, whereas behavioral avoidance is referred to the process of mosquito movement away from the treated area, and this comprises two types of action, spatial repellent and contact irritant action. Physical, physiological resistance are widely, dis, uh, are widely studied and well conducted, as you can see from the online IR mapper program. The system is very informative, in which we can obtain the information by different category, for example, years of report, countries, vector species, insecticide cases and types, mechanism and test methods. For example, what you can see here, the information on resistant to all compounds in Aedes aegypti and Aedia bopictus, detected by CDC bottle assay and the WHO susceptibility test between 2005 and 2015. That's from IR mapper program. When tabulated by class of insecticides, most found resistant in AD species were from pyrethroids, followed closely by organocholine, organophosphate, and carbamates at the least. Similarly, IR mapper show a very nicely distribution of insecticide resistance to all compounds tested. As you can see here, dense resistance has been shown from India and surrounding countries, whereas little information has been reported from the Far East countries. Like Aedes aegypti, Anopheline mosquito show greater resistance distribution to organocholine and pyrethroids as compared to organophosphate and carbamate. Some monophylline population remain susceptible, as you can see from the green marks. This area needs to be reconducted or confirmed if mosquitoes are still susceptible. Now, I would like to bring you to see the situation of Aedes aegypti resistant to Temiforce in Greater Mekong sub-region countries. This study has been done by one of my graduate students from Kasesa University. For years, Temiforce had been used for dengue public health control program and remained the most commonly used compound to control immature stages of mosquito in National Dengue Control Program. His study in interpreted the test results following the standard WHO criteria and used an open source QGIS program to map detected Temiford resistance in both AD aegypti and AD arbopictus. He obtained the resistant information from the two sources, public sources and experimental data. From public source, 122 locations in the GMS country were identified resistant, whereas 62 locations were obtained from experimental data. As you can see from here, 80% of Temu for study were derived from Thailand. Of 122 locations in different GMS country, 100 locations were found resistant in Aedes aegypti, and 22 locations were found resistant to in Aedes arbopictus. Apart from physiolo physiological resistance, behavioral avoidance also play a major role in vector control activity as the two major interventions to combat malaria and other diseases are done by using bednet and IRS. Therefore, understanding the chemical action of insecticide is definitely crucial before triggering the control intervention. And this may help ex explain why some mosquito population show no physiological resistance to insecticide. For example, Bednet and IRS impregnated with insecticide cannot be used to target most Asian mosquito vector, which show strong exophytic behavior and early and outdoor biting, one type of the avoidant behavior. At least two systems, excitoripalency system and heat assay, are available to identify the three chemical actions, which are repellent, 
toxicant and early tens. We were able to study the chemical action of insecticide. We were able to study chemical action of several insecticides in mosquito population from uh, different countries in Asia, for example, Indonesia, Taiwan, Thailand, and the Philippines. This slide shows you the evidence of behavioral avoidance responses to insecticide in various species of Anopheles population between 2001 and 2011. We also we were able to identify the evidence of behavioral avoidance responses in Aedes aegypti and Culex species to various insecticides in Thailand, regardless of uh, susceptibility level. In conclusion, insecticide resistance can be classified into two categories, physiological resistance and behavioral avoidance. Mosquito vector resistance to insecticide and types of uh, resistant mechanisms are now well documented on the IR mapper program for all regions. Although the frequency of and coverage in reporting insecticide resistance is incomplete and potentially limit, limited in geographical representation, there is evidence indicating an increasing trend in development of resistance in the country. Behavioral avoidance to all class of insecticide has been documented in many mosquito species with the greatest response to pyrethroid. Now come up with the recommendation and perspective. It is, imper it is imperative that routine insecticide susceptibility monitoring be established and broadened in both coverage and frequency in the whole regions of Asia Pacific. Very quite often, there is not enough white cost anopheline mosquito that could be carried out to assess the susceptibility of population of primary and second, secondary malaria vectors to insecticide or to carry out contact by OSA of long lasting net and spray surfaces. The exotic those for each local species by the determination of specific bedline, discriminating concentration of currently used insecticide for vector control is a crucial starting point for, mon for monitoring of resistance. Behavioral avoidance of mosquito vector to insecticide are very important components of insecticide and disease control equation. More field research is needed on this area. Searching for alternative interventions to minimize the further ev uh, evolution as well as to preserve the efficacy of existing insecticide is needed. Explor explor exploration of next gen generation vector control tools in terms of net and new classes of non predatory insecticide formulation with new mode of action is also very important. Staying in partnerships in the vector control from public health expert, policy maker, researcher, public health entomologist, and private sector are also very crucial. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any question from the floor. Thanks, Dr. Leo. Uh, Professor Tirapa, uh, yes. thank you for that tour de force, uh, excellent presentation, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to move on to question time now. Uh, and uh, since Dr. Pradeep was first presenter, um, let's go to him first. And I'm going to the question and answer list from the audience. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, I'm guided by the popularity of the questions. The first one is from uh, Mohammed Far uh, Farouk Sabawun, who asks uh, Dr. Pradeep, with decreased malaria cases, why are you classifying malaria strata 
based on states and why not on district? Maybe you can give us a quick answer on that. Uh, no, exactly. It is not like that. For presentation, we have classified at the national level. We have given a guidelines and the national framework for malaria elimination, NFME. It was given as a state broadly classified and the same criteria was given to the district. And all these states, they are classifying the districts based on the district. And then the districts are also classifying at the sub-district. Even the stratification has gone to the village level. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, useful. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Tessa, one for you. This is a question. There are several questions that came in before the uh, webinar. It's from people that were, that were registering and they submitted a question at the same time. So I gleaned some questions from that source as well. Dr. Tessa, given the threats of malaria and also other viruses in your region of uh, responsibility, can you tell us about entomological capacity to deal with these threats? Are there enough entomologists and are they adequately capacitated to do their jobs? If not, what, where are the shortfalls and what could be done to enhance adverse vector control and entomological skills? Just some uh, thoughts from you, Tessa. Thanks, that's a big question. I can do 10 more minutes if you like. <laughs> Let's try and keep it down to two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes, okay. Um, so I think the first thing is that the capacity is quite variable across the countries of the Pacific. So we're talking about 22, 23 countries. In fact, the malaria endemic countries are the ones that have the greatest entomological capacity, I think. So PNG has some capacity in the program, but they have support from PNG Institute of Medical Research. Solomon Islands have a postgraduate trained entomologist. Um, Vanuatu has a senior vector control person and WHO supports two entomologists within the program as well. Um, but if you talk about other Pacific Island countries that really face a high burden of dengue, they have, with the exception of Fiji and a few uh, countries in the Northern Pacific, there's very, very limited capacity. Often the vector control that's done is reactive so once there is a, an outbreak of dengue, um, then they would go and do some entomological investigations as part of the, the case investigations to respond. Um, but it's, there's not really an ongoing program of surveillance in many of these countries. Um, some of them have no entomologist. Some of them have the entomological functions absorbed into other public health functions. Um, and in recognition of this limited capacity and the need to train individuals and strengthen vector control, um, we've recently uh, started a project supported by DFAT in collaboration with James Cook University and a number of other partners to look at strengthening capacity for surveillance and capacity for vector control across 12 targeted countries. Then we're building a network to make sure that the lessons learned from that will be disseminated to other countries beyond the, the core 12. So I think that it's fantastic that this funding is being made available. Um, the first step, of course, is a vector control needs assessment to work out exactly what is the situation. Who do they have? What roles are they performing? Where are the major gaps? And, and how can we listen to what they are saying that they need, given that they have all massive amounts of competing priorities to be able to deliver to them uh, what would be the most efficacious for, for public health protection? Uh, thank you, Tessa. I, may, I was maybe a little unfair on you. I shouldn't have said two minutes. That was overreaction. I should have said four minutes because the question deserves four minutes. But it, in fact, it deserves a lot more than that. But thank you for that uh, overview. And good luck with the PACMOSI project. We're much needed. Uh, it's great to hear about that. Uh, good to know. Uh, Professor Tirapa, uh, I've got several questions for you. Okay. But... Uh, and I'm going to jump to the fourth question I had for you as first. So, Professor Tirapap, you are head of one of the best and most highly respected entomology departments in Asia Pacific. How's that for a compliment? Uh, and so you are a good person to give opinion on this uh, issue. It seems that entomological capacity is in short supply at global scale. It's common knowledge. Even Time Magazine wrote about that a few years ago, uh, including in the Asia Pacific. In your department, are you seeing a continuing interest in entomology as a career, as a subject? 
uh, are student numbers stable or are they increasing, reflecting increasing interest maybe, or is it decreasing as a general trend? Uh, what is your sense? Uh, is there interest in entomology as a career? And, and if it's declining, you know, what can we do to improve the situation? Or what are the reasons why it's declining? Oh, very, very good questions, uh, Leo. Uh, thanks for asking this question. I think this is very, it, uh, in, uh, entomologists, medical entomologists or public health entomologists now, we are, we are lacking. And I think it, uh, we, need to, we need to produce uh, this type of uh, career. The problem that I'm facing now, even in my lab, we have uh, very few uh, medical entomologists uh, study at, at uh, Gatsaysa University. One big uh, problem, I think, maybe be, uh, from the funding. So what I, what I have uh, done before, I, I fully support the student who, who go for a PhD here. I think this is the, the major thing without funding support. I don't think no one would like to, uh, to go for a PhD. So this we need uh, uh, global uh, 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 help, global support, I think, to, to make more or to have more medical endomologists uh, uh, success. So, so I think one thing that is the budget, uh, the, the, the funding to help students. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I want, I'd like to follow up on that, uh, Professor Therapap, because uh, perhaps this is a, a subject to sit over a beer and discuss. It needs a, a lot more discussion to try and unravel. I mean, funding is obviously a problem, but funding is the problem for whatever discipline, probably. Okay, for some subjects, it's maybe easier to get uh, uh, funding. But um, do you think that there's a decline in interest among students or young people in following up? Is an entomological career uh, sufficiently attractive? If funding was made available yeah. through, do yeah. you think more people would actually apply? Are there enough jobs for them available? Are the jobs sufficiently well paid? Uh, so entomology as a career uh, is it an attractive option for a young person? Yeah, uh, this is uh, again uh, <clears throat> uh, not very easy to answer. But uh, <laughs> I, what what uh, yeah. what I can see now, is, uh, even my department, uh, we get uh, less and less uh, student who is interested uh, in entomology. But uh, we, I think we can. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know how uh, how 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 to say, but but uh, we can we can produce more if if I think it did, this area should be should be opened by uh, encourage the young generation to study entomology or biology. This is very important. So, yeah. but to answer your question, I think it's not very easy now. This is the young generation. They they try to to work on another another thing that to get the money or to get the uh, another thing else, not education. Yeah, no, thank you for that, uh, Professor Therapap. Uh, you know, it sounds like it's a, a mix of, uh, you know, one has to create an, an awareness, an increased awareness amongst young people about entomology and uh, as a career uh, to incentivize entomology as a career by creating job opportunities that lead uh, along clearly defined career paths uh, that, that are rewarding uh, to engage on. And then of course, increase funding accessibility to enable those students then to, uh, to, to teach and get into jobs and so on. So thank you for those uh, uh, perspectives. I'm going to move back to uh, Dr. Pradeep. Back with you, uh, and I'm going to uh, question here from Michael McDonald. Are you finding, and I think you, you didn't want to answer it uh, by typing it in, you want to, you prefer to answer it live. Are you finding Anopheli Stevens eye in the same larval habitats as Aedes aegypti? And if so, are you using common surveillance and control strategies? 
Uh, do you want to do you want to say something about that? Yes, this is an important question which we have also been looking since beginning of our career. That is, Stephen Sai breeding and Aries breeding are definitely in same place. We are we are finding co-breeding. And in urban areas, precisely because Stephen Sai has been taken as an urban vector by and large. Uh, then the larvae side, anti-larval control has been the prioritized uh, vector control tool for the the, the Stephen Sai. Uh, using usually we put Temepos uh, in different doses, which is one of the safest insecticide. And then whatever methods we are using for ADs that helps in Stephen Sai control also. But unfortunately, the the urban cities, municipalities, corporation, on the local bodies, their awareness is not as uh, good as it is in the rural sectors because there the entire machinery is working from there, and this the the training of the skill that is that is what we are talking of entomological intelligence and entomological skill because. That particular training and the skill, how, what, those, what insecticide, how frequently it is to be used. We have had a program of urban malaria scheme, which was launched in 1971 in India. And it has taken a lesson from the erstwhile national filaria control program, which was launched in 1955. Both of them, they were based on the, the anti-larval work precisely in urban areas. So the, taking the clue from that, there are some work is going on and the answer is yes that that is Stephen Sai and uh, Edis are cooperating. Okay that's interesting uh, but there was another aspect to Michael's question uh, that it seems you know uh, vector control has has become uh, compartmentalized into different silos like you get the National Malaria Control Program that will focus on on Anopheles uh, uh, larvae uh, or Anopheles breeding and Anopheles control. And then you get the dengue, dengue vector units that will focus on Aedes control and so on. And there's, there's a divide that, uh, you know, if that could be bridged and some collaboration promoted, uh, you know, it could go a long way towards uh, improving or, uh, well, yes, improving surveillance uh, with, uh, you know, mutual reporting or com complementary reporting opportunities. But uh, interesting to know that you are finding that, you know, Aedes and uh, Stevens are using the same uh, breeding sites. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pradeep. I'm going to go over to Dr. Tessa again. Uh, Dr. Tessa, insecticide resistance is a global challenge in all countries faced with malaria and arboviruses. What is being done in your region to monitor and deal with this challenge? And uh, do adequate facilities exist to undertake resistance monitoring? Thank you very much. Um, the three malaria endemic countries certainly uh, conduct annual insecticide resistance monitoring in selected sites. Um, to date, there's been no confirmed pyrethroid resistance. There's some indication of DDT resistance due to historical usage, uh, but there's, there's been probable, uh, possible resistance, but, but no confirmed resistance um, at two sites in Vanuatu and one site in Solomon Islands. Um, in terms of the, the facilities available, so if we're talking about insectaries, again, the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research, I think has good facilities available and support the Ministry of Health with the monitoring. In Vanuatu, we have no functional insectary in Solomon Islands, it's also very limited. So I think there is a, a major issue with, um, with, with support for insecticide resistance monitoring. And of course, this is ever the more important when we're looking at ensuring that we can make evidence-based decisions around selecting our IRS active ingredient. So while there has been a heavy reliance on LLINs, maybe there's been less of a case for monitoring, even though it's still absolutely required, but now, we really need that information to be able to select um, in an informed way the, the active that we're using for IRS. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tessa. Interesting that. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Tirapap, I'm going to try and ask three questions to each person because we've, we've run out of time, but this is so interesting. I don't want to let go. So 
hopefully there are some people still hanging in and, and our speakers are willing to go for another round. But uh, Professor Tirapap, um, let me ask you what I was going to be your second question. This uh, question relates to Aedes vectors of dengue and it also ties in with a previous question to uh, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, this question relates to Aedes vectors of dengue, container breeders, and sometimes also to Anopheles that breed in wells and small volumes of standing water, such as Anopheles Stevens eye. What are your thoughts about the promotion and encouragement of larvivorous fish species, mm. such as guppies, and the potential environmental risk of such exotic species escaping into the environment to the detriment of indigenous fish species. Should the use of uh, small fish species that feed very effectively on mosquito larvae in relatively confined uh, quantities of water, should that be encouraged if we can search and find indigenous ecological equivalents that may be able to be cultured and used? Any thoughts about, around, generally, just your thoughts around the use of larvivorous uh, small fish for container or small volume uh, mosquito breeding breeders? Uh, uh, please, uh, Professor Terapa. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leo. This uh, question is uh, it a it good question too for control dengue in the community. And uh, besides the TAMI force, uh, we are now uh, trying to get another uh, control tools to control dengue. Well, fish is one of the most uh, potential tool that we can use. But uh, what we are concerning right now is about the it's about the uh, uh, eco 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 ecological uh, problem that uh, fish can might be invade the species and make problems in the area. But uh, I think one thing that uh, we have to educate, if we want to use it, we have to educate the people in the, com in the community to be sure that uh, the, uh, what, what it, what, how to use the, uh, this kind of guppy gu fish in the area. But what you can see, uh, dengue uh, situation actually restricted uh, in the community in the area. So a small container, but uh, if the community compliance is very well conducted, I think it maybe we can uh, we can use this kind of uh, control to reduce dengue transmission in the community. Fully agree. Uh, fully agree, uh, Professor Terapap. Uh, I mean, it's nice in theory to say we must find indigenous species to replace guppy fish. In practice, it's not quite that easy because fish species tend to be very specific in their habitat requirements uh, with you know, what food they feed on, uh, what breeding substrates uh, uh, they, they require. Uh, so it becomes complicated and guppy fish have just been very easy to, to breed and use, plus they're attractive. Uh, so it makes it culturally acceptable. So. Uh, but it's a very important topic. Thank you, Professor Tirapap. So, if if everybody, if uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to do one more round of questions. Um, so we go back to Dr. Pradeep, and I'm going to go to the list for you. Uh, there was a question that was up top uh, a few seconds ago from Vasantan John. Dr. Srivastava, is India encouraging the introduction of piperonal or, or PBO nets and new generation longer residual active insecticides for IRS in high burden areas? Uh, could you respond to that question? Thank you. I'll keep my comments reserved openly. These are all some policy decisions, uh, but I can just tell at this moment that the trials are going on. In okay. India, there is an institutional mechanism that once something is recommended for the multinational trial or OPA's recommendation, then the indigenous trials are done in our climatic condition by the recognized institutions. And then 
it it passes through an institutional mechanism once it gets cleared then there is a regulatory body central insecticide board they uh, register it once they register then only the process of inclusion in the program can take place uh okay thank you um thank you dr pradeep i have a question here from uh, jeffrey he to uh, tessa take to tessa uh and jeffrey asks high quality time bound well supervised and targeted irs with non pyrethroid insecticides is required to rapidly reduce disease burden exclusively in prioritized outbreak areas this strategy is not intended to compensate for deficiencies in llin distributions uh in some countries annual single cycle preventive irs was effective in bringing down uh the api in selected high malaria burn areas what are the conditions for recommending an aggressive implementation of mass llin distribution and targeted irs combination in situations where this combination have been effective in reduction in the api uh levels prior to the publication of who 2019 normative guidance on malaria vector control i hope you you got that question i would have to reread it another two times to fully get it but this uh, does <laughs> you want to respond to that I do I suspect Jeffrey prepared that in advance and copy and pasted it in because no one can type that much in a comment book. Um uh so so it's a really good question. I think there's there's the malaria vector control guidelines um published by WHO which has quite a clear stance that there shouldn't be an overlap of LLINs and IRS to compensate for deficiencies in either. This recommendation was developed based on evidence from a number of studies. that predominantly were in high burden areas um mainly i think i can't remember exactly what they were but i did work on the guidelines when i was at at headquarters but i think there's recognition now that these guidelines are very much focused on high burden areas because that is where the evidence is available for um there does need to be i think some adaptation of the recommendations so the guidelines review committee is now looking at the evidence that may be available for other settings beyond those high burden predominantly sub-saharan african areas um and i think that there may be some some adaptation of the guidance that we hope to be able to develop i don't know the time frame around that but to me clear historical evidence that shows that this can have an impact is justification particularly if the ministry of health are very supportive of the intervention and if they think that this is what's required in the setting then and they have the the accumulated experience of this being applied successfully then i think that's where we need to defer to our country uh colleagues who have had much more experience working and seeing the impact of this in the past so while there are very strict guidelines that have been developed they are again needing some adaptation i think for the lower transmission settings um and really to take a pragmatic approach that if we are ultimately trying to get rid of every single last little pocket of transmission then we need to do more than we have been doing in the past and this is quite clear that that llins won't take us there they won't get us to malaria elimination in these three settings that um I've described in the pacific and if yeah. i may one more thing that's yeah, not sure. related to the question Go it is it. related to um insecticide resistance which is that there's a tool called malaria threats map I've shared the link in the chat section but this is quite an interesting tool um that you can have a look at it's got a summary of vector insecticide resistance data as has been reported to WHO by national programs so ministries of health and also extracted from publications and it has other malaria data there including information on invasive vector species so it's quite a nice tool to be able to go and have a look at the status at dif- of different countries around the world for the different insecticide classes and also mechanisms excellent Okay, excellent. Thank you for that response, uh, Tessa. So, uh Professor Terapap, this is the last question to you. Uh please don't go, members of the audience. I'm going to ask you please uh to just spend 2 minute 1 minute responding to those poll questions. So, please don't leave on mass. Uh you got to listen to Prof Terapap first. 
uh, a question for you, Professor Tirapap. Recent work in Africa has demonstrated the potential use of transflutherin as a spatial repellent for personal protection, such as transflutherin impregnated sandals, chair seats, and cloth strips that can be strung around areas where people sit outdoors or sleep outdoors. And this has particular relevance and potential for application amongst forest goers. And in, here in Asia Pacific, we know about the problems associated with outdoor biting and forest goers and so on. Uh, so has this, this particular application of transflutherin impregnated materials has potential among forest goers who do not like to use bed nets or hammock nets because of the heat that builds up inside these nets. So my question to you is, given the high levels of resistance to deltamethrin and other pyrethroids as used in bed nets or IRS, what is the potential for cross resistance to transflutherin, even though it is not uh, used as a contact insecticide, but rather as a, a space repellent? Are such deltamethrin resistance strains likely to have cross tolerance when exposed to transflutherin? Or do you think the chemical properties are sufficiently different to enable practical use of repellents uh, such as transflutherin, which is generating considerable interest? It reflects uh, some ignorance, but you're the, you're the person to illuminate us. Some comments from you, Professor Tirapa. Uh, yes, uh, uh, very good questions, uh, Leo. Uh, that transfutrin is very good uh, chemicals. It's very, very highly uh, volatile, high volatile compounds. That uh, what we what we can see uh, in our uh, in our study at KU, we have found some Aedes aegypti the field population starting resistant to transfutrin, mm -hmm. and I think uh, for anaphrenes, uh, we don't know in the future, but, but if we keep using transfutrin because of the high volatile compound, and I think uh, in the future one day, we might face problem with the transfutrin resistant. As you can see from DDT in the past, and then we get cross resistant, uh, re resistant to pyrethroids, delta metrin, permetrin. So it could be happen for, could happen for transfutrin in the future. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. So uh, again, I please know that I am personally, uh, and I'm sure I reflect the feeling of uh, most of our audience, if not all our audience, uh, this has been a very stimulating uh, and satisfying discussion. Uh, and it's because of the high level of the presentations that we receive from each of the three of you. Sincere thank you. From all of us, we are very grateful. Uh, what we are going to do to our audience members that took the time and the trouble to write down questions, uh, we are going to assemble all those questions and send them off to our presenters and ask our presenters if they would mind responding in writing to those questions. And then those uh, answers, responses to your questions will be made available on the same website where the uh, recording will be uh, located. I'd like to ask our audience members now, please help us uh, 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 understand the value of these webinars and also potential future topics for these webinars, just by filling in these uh, two quick polls, if you don't mind. Thank you, one and all. It's been a wonderful hour and a half or whatever it is, hour and a half, yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Great webinars, at least as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.